can I thank you for inviting me to speak? It's um, a, a real honour to be speaking uh, on this occasion. I've got a, a long history of association with South Bank. Uh, when I was, um, what was it called back then? Tra uh, training contract now. What was it called back in the dark ages? Article clerk. Article clerk, that's right. I, I was an article clerk. <laughs> I was an article clerk at a firm in Bernberg Pearson Partners, which was up the road, London Bridge. And uh, as an article clerk, not earning much money, much less now, I suspect, mm -hmm. and decided that I would take up teaching. And the closest university was this one. So it was a bit by accident. So I started teaching here. I, I think I did it for a few years and kept up an association with the university. And uh, I was such a good teacher. Uh, I'm not blowing my own trumpet here. <laughs> but some years later, when, I, uh, when we set up practice in East London, there was a local Italian delicatessen that opened that supplied sandwiches to all the staff at uh, the firm. And I walked in, and there was my star student. He was the one that opened this. He'd gone away from the door and opened up a business, and he was incredibly successful. So that's my success. Completely changed his <laughs> career from law to business. Um, the only good thing about that, we got sandwiches at 50%. <laughs> from then on, I, I, I've kept in touch, and it's no coincidence that um, three people, three lawyers on the Lawrence Inquiry had an association with South Bank University. And I think that's a testament to the sort of um, commitment that this university has to community law. Now, I didn't come to this university. Um, I went to a university which should remain nameless in East London, the University of... Um, and... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I was very lucky because I had lecturers there who I suspect, uh, as part of the polytechnics of that era, uh, were talking not just about some philosophical basis for law and having some abstract view about contract and equity, etc. It, it was a very practical grounding. And the lessons I learned there were looking at judgments and looking and reading between the lines, whether it's contract crime, etc. Reading between the lines and, uh, and reading things like the Politics of Judiciary by J.A.G. Griffiths. It was those things which influenced my outlook on life and I'm, uh, it was great to see that that is continuing with this university, which is why my association continues, apart from the fact that I'm a contracted to be a visiting lecturer and professor. My mum's very proud of that, by the way. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's by way of introduction, sorry. I may take a bit of time. I, I've done something formal for today, and it is Stephen Lawrence's case, it's impact and legacy, and I want to talk about its impact. And Dora and I have been in double act now for many years, 19 years, so uh, we <coughs> haven't exchanged um, our presentation today, so there may be some overlap. Uh, and I'm gonna do it from a legal perspective, and Dora will do it from hers. The, I apologize in advance because in 19 years, I've accumulated so much information about this case that I can talk ad nauseum. I have talked ad nauseum about this topic. Uh, and I've concentrated on certain aspects. So forgive me if certain things that you wanted to hear from me are not in here, uh, and things which are not that you didn't want to hear are here. It's my take on this, and I hope uh, you'll uh, certainly enjoy listening to it. Um, Everyone tells me not to start with a joke, but I'm going to start with a joke. It's, uh, it just shows how bad I would be if I were a comedian, but I start with a joke. Nicholas Sarkozy, Vladimir Putin, and David Cameron happen to be visiting an art gallery when they come across a painting showing Adam and Eve in the classic repose that all of us uh, have seen. They begin to discuss the identity of the painter. Sarkozy says that the painter is of French origin. The painting shows a romantic scene full of love. Putin says, no, the painter must be of Russian origin. The two are sharing what little they have equally between them. Cameron, however, is convinced that the painter is British. At press as to why he thinks so, he states that the two are half-closed and half-starving, yet they still think they're in paradise. <laughs> I'm glad I got a laugh. I, I tell you that to illustrate a point, a, a more serious point. The punchline 
it's only effective if the audience it's yourselves are in on the joke. The, the namely, the nature of Britain or the British or those who are viewed as British is to illustrate the point that there are certain views of the British or Britishness which are held by different parts of the community. And I don't know whether you recall the riots up in Bradford and Burnley, but after that occurred, a man from Burnley was quoted in one of the newspapers saying, racial attacks, that's what Britain's all about, isn't it? And to many of the black communities, that's what this country epitomizes, the perception they have of what is at the heart of our society. To these individuals, notions of diversity and multiculturalism are meaningless epithets designed to cloak the reality that we face on a daily basis. In one sense, if you want to draw up a profit and loss account about what life was like in 93 when Stephen was murdered, or what it's like now, little has changed apart from perhaps you might think some of the terminology. We were colours within Asian and Afro-Caribbean. We're ethnic minorities, minority ethnic communities, visible minorities, people of colour. And now we are part of a diverse community. For my part, coming as I do from a community activist point of view, I always thought the most appropriate term to describe us was the black community, because to treat the issue on the basis of ethnicity alone is to view it in apolitical terms. Yet the question of race is nothing more, nothing less than political in nature. Uh, and I don't know whether you've read anything ab about the US, but there are newer and newer phrases to describe the black communities. Uh, yet on the other hand, uh, only a few years ago, the prison population in the US, the black prison population, went beyond the 50% mark. And so there is this contradistinction and the fact that these people were now called people of colour made not an iota of difference of their daily lives. Uh, the point that I'm trying to make somewhat clumsily, you may think, is that the past few decades, indeed the past 19 years, have seen attempts at integration on an ethnic, multicultural level, not at a political level. We have allowed ourselves to be ethnicised, believing that to be the route to our acceptance understand who I am and you will accept who I am. In my view, that has failed abysmally. In my view, today's concept of diversity has masked the reality that exists and suggested progress when there has been little, if any. And what progress that has been made, in my view, has taken place in no small part to the determination and courage of one family and one person in particular, Doreen Lawrence. Her journey, her journey on that day and mine, inextricably linked, hers in the most tragic circumstances occurred on the 22nd of April, 1993. And I pause and digress slightly. I was, I think, in this room or one of the smaller lecture theatres about a year ago before the trial of Stephen Lawrence's killers took place. And I mentioned the name Stephen Lawrence. And as I looked across the audience, there were quizzical faces. There was a generation of individuals at this university who had never heard the name. We've had much publicity since then. And it occurred to me that there's a generation who don't know the facts of the case and that that iconic image has become a byword for injustice without knowing what the reality was. But imagine, and I can still to this day, it was a Friday afternoon and I got a call while I was sitting in an attic office in Ealing Broadway when I received a call. The call was about a murder taking place on Wellhall Road. Stephen and his friend Dwayne Brooks were trying to get home at about 10.30 p.m. They were set upon by five or six white racist youths. One of them shouted, what, what, nigger? Stephen was able to run some 200 yards before he collapsed, a testament to, to his physical prowess but he had two major arteries severed. Blood was pumping at a rate of knots. He collapsed outside a house where a young girl, 14-year-old young girl, came out, and when the police arrived, she said, I've got first aid training. I want to help. Neither the police who arrived at the scene <coughs> offered any assistance to Stephen as he lay dying, bleeding. 
nor did they allow this young girl who had first aid assistance to assist in any way. It's no surprise, then, perhaps, that Doreen, many years later, said that those police officers did not want to get their hands dirtied with a black man's blood. Within hours of that murder, suspects' names came flooding into the incident room, but no arrests were made. A surveillance operation took place at the house of those who were named. Yet that surveillance operation did not have the power or the ability to stop individuals who were taking black bin liners out of their homes, possibly, probably, with blood-stained clothing. It wasn't until the arrival of Nelson Mandela in this country on the 6th of May, 1993, that things started to change. Because Dorian and Neville and the family met Nelson Mandela, and he was interviewed on the BBC News. For the first time, the Lawrence case was the first item on the national news agenda. And Nelson Mandela was comparing apartheid South Africa to Britain when he said, perhaps, in this country, like apartheid South Africa, black lives were cheap. The next day, arrests were made. Nothing had changed from the 22nd of April to the 7th of May. The police felt the pressure of a leader, a global leader in our world. Individuals were arrested. Two months later, charges were dropped. I had to make, and I don't know whether Doran recalls this, I had to make one of the most difficult calls in my career as a solicitor. I was informed by the CPS that they were going to drop the charges. Doreen and Neville and her family had gone to Jamaica to bury Stephen. I received the information the charges were going to be dropped. Doreen and the family wanted good news. I was the bearer of bad. I had to tell them. Charges were being dropped against those individuals suspected of Stephen's murder. I can't imagine what they must have felt like on the day at the time when they were burying Stephen thousands of miles away. But that's what happened. Now, I had done practical law at university. I was involved in community law as an activist. And what the family wanted to know from me when they came back, you're the lawyer. What do we do? How do we go forward? It was quite simple as far as I was concerned back then. The CPS charge, the police arrest CPS charge, you go to court, you get a conviction. It wasn't happening. So we came up with the idea of public inquiry. The Human Rights Act wasn't in place back then. And what we did, about 14 of us, Doreen wasn't there at the time, most of the family, a whole group of black individuals arrived at the Home Office and sat around a wooden table in a boardroom at the Home Office with a whole group of white ministers and civil servants. And they looked at us and wondered what the hell was going on. We said, we want a public inquiry. It was a Tory government. They said, no. And that, as far as I was concerned, the family was, concerned, was the end of it. Now, people say, well, uh, you must have known about private prosecution, things should have happened, and, and all the rest of it, and you could have done something about it. Just imagine the scenario. You've had an investigation. CPS have decided there's going to be no charges. There was a further investigation. Nothing came about of that. There was the um, audio-visual probe in the individual's houses, which showed that race, which some of you may have seen in the last trial. Nothing. CPS said there's going to be no prosecution whatsoever. I happen to be a defence lawyer, though known for prosecuting in this case. In 1994, I was defending six Bengali youths who'd been arrested for another murder a murder in Somerstown, in King's Cross. That received far more publicity than the case of Stephen Lawrence back then. His name was Richard Everett. Princess Diana went and laid some flowers at the point that he was, uh, he was killed. Within hours, six Bengali youths had been arrested for the murder. They were all charged. We ended up in court. The evidence against one of them was we did it in it. That was it. I... At the time, knowing as I did that there was probably some racism within the criminal justice system, I thought, how can we reconcile the fact that a white individual has been killed and individuals of a particular background have been charged and prosecuted 
The circumstances with the evidence meant that they should never have gone to court. At the same time, in circumstances where we have a black victim and the Crown Prosecution Service is saying there's insufficient evidence to charge. I found that difficult to reconcile. And the CPS lawyer, Howard Younglewood, in the Lawrence case, said at the inquiry that took place much later that he sent me a letter apparently begging me not to take on the private prosecution. The same CPS who decided they would prosecute this young Bengali man whose case was thrown out in court eventually. Now, that is irreconcilable. And there's been much criticism of the private prosecution and, and much anguish, certainly, on my part and, and the family. But I'm jumping the gun. Nothing was happening. We had an inquest in February 1997 at which um, the suspect, so-called suspect, gave evidence. But key in that particular case, particular hearing, was a question-answer session which led to many millions of pounds being spent for a public inquiry and what happened thereafter. During the course of the private prosecution, we had the assistance of the police officers. We had all the prosecution statements, we had all the unused material, we had everything that we understood was the evidence against those um, suspected of Stephen's murder. And we could tell that there were many, many holes in the way the, the police had acted, many failures. And um, we expected the police officer who had been assisting us to be able to accept that. And so he gave evidence in court, and Michael Mansford, acting on behalf of the family, asked him a question, and we thought the answer was straightforward. He said, now that you know what happened during the course of the investigation, do you accept that anything had gone wrong? His answer was no. And Doreen, uh, when we came out of court, for the first time, said, I can't believe what's happened. We need to put a complaint in against the police. And we did, for the first time. And this was 1997, four years after. Though we were complaining about what the police were doing, it was the first time that a formal complaint was put in. That complaint was investigated by a neighbouring police force, Kent, and they found some 14 lines of inquiry that the Met had failed to follow. That answer then led to a meeting with uh, then home, uh, shadow Home Secretary Jack Straw. Uh, and Jack Straw will uh, deny this to his dying days, but at that meeting, he promised a public inquiry should the Labour Party get into government. So I certainly, I don't know about you, Dora, I went out and I started campaigning for the Labour Party to get into the government. <laughs> In fact, I stood against them. That's a, that's a different story. Jack Straw, two to his word, um, I don't know whether you remember the iconic uh, footage of Cherie Blair coming out at number 10 with her hair all messed up and receiving flowers. Um, that was, I remember that day, not because Labour Party had got into government, because I remember the promise the promise that Jack Straw had made. And he was true to his promise. He, um, on the 31st of July 1997, he ordered the inquiry and appointed Sir William McPherson to chair it with three advisors, one of whom, John St. Thomas, is probably going to be the next Archbishop. The pub inquiry sat at the Elephant Castle <coughs> in that horrible pink building <laughs> that was the bane of my life for uh, 69 days. It was awful. It was on the... Uh, Second floor, fourth floor, I can't remember now. Fourth floor. In 1998, sat for 69 days, heard from 88 witnesses. I was witness 88. It was a strange day for me, um, and I speak as a lawyer. Because I was representing the family, and Michael Mansfield QC was representing the advocate. But as I walked into that room, there were rows and rows of desks with eminent QCs representing all of the police. And at inquiries, you're told in advance whether criticisms are going to be made of you. None of them, the police, could criticise Dorian and Neville. They dare not. But me? I was an a, a anti-racist lawyer. A, a term of abuse back then. There wasn't such things as human rights. And somehow, they thought that because I answered the phone at one o'clock at night, 
that I somehow I wasn't just a professional lawyer who put the phone down at five or six o'clock. The community lawyers were somehow different. They somehow went the extra mile, but not for good reasons, because police officers I knew from rumours would suspect your reasons for assisting in these cases. You're not doing it for money, so what is it? It must be something else. Anyway, as police officer, after police officer gave evidence, they would, the police officers, barristers, would say to them, so was it Mr. Khan who uh, hindered this? So was it Mr. Khan who did that? And I was pleading with Michael Mansfield, saying to him, aren't you going to put my case? And he said, no, I'm the lawyer for the Lawrences. And I tell you this for this reason, that Mike did such a fantastic job, Mike and Steve and, and the others, barristers who were there, that by the time I gave evidence on day 69, the whole atmosphere had changed in the inquiry. It had changed the nature of the lawyer representing a family. And there was one question that I remember answering, which drew a bit of uh, amusement from the, uh, the crowd sitting there. Because Michael Manson would start with every witness, every police officer, and say, do you accept that there, anything had gone wrong with, the, uh, with your investigation? And every police officer would say no. Obviously. By the end of the cross-examination, Mike would have listed 22, 23, 25 failures. It would be highly embarrassing. So I was asked that question. Mr. Khan, did you do anything wrong? Or, or in fact, it said, do you, re do you regret anything that you did? And I said, yes. And my supporters of the public gallery were aghast. What's he going to say now? Because I'd been accused of being really hard on the police. But I was constantly sending them letters and bombarding them with phone calls. And, and so there was this pregnant pause. And so counsel said, well, what was it? And I said, I wasn't hard enough on the police. <laughs> and it, it, the truth was, my job as a lawyer representing the family was I needed to ensure that individuals were arrested. And I didn't get it. And I didn't get the information. More importantly, what developed from there was that the, an anti-racist lawyer, a human rights lawyer, an active law, activist lawyer, was not a badge of dishonor, but a badge of honor, because it meant that you were fighting on the side of justice. And that, to me, from a lawyer's perspective, was a critical change in the way that the inquiry developed. But it wasn't just the recommendations of the report that came out of it. It was the fact that the family, for the first time, was able to ask questions of one of the most powerful institutions in society. It came out with 70 recommendations, but for me, the critical thing that it came out with was a mantra that I called a recognition, acknowledgement, and acceptance of racism. And again, some of you, some of you uh, are, are, are too, too old, and you're way too old, but some of you are young enough <laughs> not to remember what 1993 was like. But the idea that you could go to a police officer and convince them that racism was somehow part of the story behind an attack was just inconceivable. It just didn't happen. And so now racism became official. Not only that, but the Daily Mail got involved. The Daily Mail that was in the heart of Middle England and uh, society. What now happened was that everybody knew. The problem was not now with the black communities but it was with the institutions. The problem didn't lie within those communities. The problem lay within society and the institutions that dealt with it. And so what we had then, subsequently, were government reports about institutional racism within the CPS, within the health service, and so on. Institutions around the country were attempting to recognize, acknowledge, and accept the concept of institutionalized racism. And so what Sir William McPherson ended up doing is defining or redefining the whole concept of institutionalised discrimination and racism. And in my travels talking about this case, I, I came across a lot of different examples of how one might explain it. And one of the most slightly bizarre ones, but interesting ones, was this. A, a baby food company was having some difficulty selling its product in a largely black community. And to deal with the problem, the designers looked at the product afresh and noted that the wrapping 
portrayed a blonde, blue-eyed baby? The answer, it seemed, to the designers was to change the wrapping, which was speedily done to reflect its potential customers. Unfortunately, it had little effect. Sales were still low. The designers, as I say, went back to the drawing board and pondered the problem until some bright spot realised that it wasn't the wrapping that was affected sales, but the actual product inside the container. It was awful. <laughs> the point is that far too often... <coughs> when we deal with issues of race, there is a cosmetic approach to solving the issue. And what you need is the scaffolding propping it up to be dismantled piece by piece. And that is the concept of institutionalized racism. You've got to get rid of the structural basis upon which racism is based. And the reality is that in the, in the years after the Lawrence Inquiry, organizations have accepted the obvious truths of what happened. But there have been those who say, its political correctness gone mad. They're uh, pining for return to the ignorance pre Macpherson, pre the Lawrence Inquiry. And what I say to them is I paraphrase a Turkish proverb the caravan has moved on, and those left behind are just barking. <laughs> I'm actually not sure quite what that means, it just sounds like. It. But see, institutional racism isn't about lone individuals. It's about structures. And it's about the government, and it's about those who are in leadership positions. Because we are all, you in this university, as students and alumni who are working in the environment, you're all influenced and guided by the political culture around you. And that political culture is set by declarations, laws, edicts, which sets the tone, the tenor, the climate of race relations in society. And I can't forget, at the inquiry, part two of the inquiry, Sir Paul Condon, who was then the Met Commissioner, came along. And he was asked by Richard Stone, who was one of the advisors, he said, a bit like that drugs, um, anti-drugs um, campaign, just say yes, just say institutionalised racism exists. And he wouldn't accept it. And Richard Stone said, just say yes, and some um, burden will be lifted from your shoulders. And he wouldn't accept it. He wouldn't accept it. And the Commissioner's reluctance was noted in the report and this is what it said. It's quite an interesting uh, phrase, an important one. There is a small but significant difference between acknowledging that such features, racism, can exist and acknowledging that they do exist. There must be an unequivocal acceptance that the problem actually exists as a prerequisite to addressing it successfully. You have to accept it before you can deal with it. I know that sounds trite, but I'm a lawyer who started in 1991, many years ago. And it may be now that there is that acceptance. And people say to me, well, have things changed? Yes, they have. Not that racism doesn't exist. It's just that now we have the structures, the laws, the armory, the ability to make sure that we can do something about when it raises its head. But just dealing with this unequivocal acceptance, because what it raised was what's called the reality spectrum. And in this audience, I suspect that there are those have gone about their daily business and experienced racism on a daily basis. There will be others in this audience who have never experienced it at all and don't know what we're talking about. That's a reality spectrum. And let me give you an example. Again, part of the inquiry. What would happen would be police officers would come to the inquiry, give evidence to Sir William McPherson, and in, I think it was West London, a chief superintendent came along and gave evidence. He said, oh, my area is fantastic. We're doing this, we're doing that. We're doing a brilliant job dealing with racism in, on our patch. He gave evidence at 10 o'clock. That afternoon, as we sat there, we listened to a middle-aged Asian man who began by saying that on listening to the police officer's evidence that morning about the wonderful area he was policing, he decided that he would move there straight away, only to realise that he'd been living there for the last 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> For years before the Lawrence case, before what Doreen and her family did, as I said, we had fought a losing battle with police officers and the prosecuting authorities to accept that race attacks were being perpetrated. It was an uphill task. And rather than being protected, the victims were being persecuted and prosecuted. One of the cases I first became involved in was called the Newman 7 case in Newman, East London, where seven young Asian lads protect themselves against racists, and they were prosecuted and they faced a case of violent disorder 
and the Old Bailey were acquitted on the grounds of self-defence is no offence. Those were the days. And no amount of pressure from me or anybody else could change that. And then along comes Dory. The cultural atmosphere of the time was impervious to the concept that some of us now take for granted. It wasn't until Stephen was killed that that perception started to change. And that has led to real potential for change. The paradigm has shifted so that now racism exists within the police service, not within the black communities. That's where the problem lies. But more significantly, and I will start winding up, is that the paradigm shifted. The vic that victims' rights now became far more important. And not only did Jack Straw introduce uh, or set up the Lawrence Inquiry, but his government promised us what I think is something we must cherish, the Human Rights Act, which is under attack. And that is a paradigm shift which comes directly on the back of the Lawrence case. Uh, and if you don't believe me, it's worth reading some of the judgments that came out post Lawrence, particularly the Zagbar case. And what it did, it changed the concept of the victim into protagonist. So now, I don't ever describe, never describe Doreen as a victim, though in reality she is. I'm sorry to talk to you about it in this way. But Doreen's a protagonist. A protagonist who can use the Human Rights Act to assert positive rights. So in 1993, when the family came to me and said, Imran, we want an answer, we want a solution. Had I had the Human Rights Act then, I would have been able to challenge the government not holding a public inquiry and had that a public inquiry in 1903. On October the 2nd, 2000, the Human Rights Act came into force. It led to other cases being incredibly successful. And one of the ironies, one of the difficult journeys that Dora and I have had to face is that when I've done those other cases, I've gone to Dora and said, what a success. Uh, and you could see in her face the bittersweet moment. Pleasure that somebody in house has been successful on the basis of what she has trailblazed. But the, on, on the other hand, in knowing that the family has not achieved justice. One case that most of you may have known about is the Zayed Barak case of a young man who was killed in Felton. Six hours before he was due to be released, he was attacked with brutal ferocity by his psychopathic racist cellmate. He was so badly beaten that his family could not recognize him when he was in hospital. And they took, they could have taken some comfort from the fact that he didn't know that he was being beaten to death, except that we know that he was alive during the course of that beating because there were defensive injuries on his forearm. The simple question for the family was, why did you put a racist psychopath in with an Asian inmate? It took an internal inquiry, a CRE investigation, court of appeal, and then eventually the House of Lords to order an inquiry in that case. And I ask you to read that judgment because it encapsulated in Lord Bingham's judgment, uh, what the most senior law lord at the time, what precisely the family was saying. The family, the Lawrence family was saying from 1903, something's gone wrong and we want to make sure it doesn't happen to others. And Lord Bingham, in his judgment in the case of uh, Amin and others in the House of Lords said precisely that. That under Article 2, we must make sure that there are inquiries and investigations which not only discover discreditable conduct, but we make sure that the family, uh, family's wish that it never happens again, it doesn't happen again. But the fact is that these changes, changes in the Zayed Barak case, changes in the prison service, the Lawrence case, changing in the policing, the Victoria Columbia case changes social services, and uh, all of those have produced profound change out of the selfless acts of the families. But it only takes place as a result of a death. It's only as a result of a loss that, that change seems to happen. And the price the family paid to pursue that is an unbearable one. As Dorian knows only too well, while she and her family did not achieve justice, Many others did, and society benefited. Uh, I, I finish, I hope, um, just in the last few seconds with this. I, I was describing 1903 to you. Uh, I don't think my words are sufficiently powerful to be able to convey how life was then. Let me use the words of Richard Adams, 
his son Rodney Adams died in the years before Steve was in the same vicinity. He said this, No parent expects or wishes to outlive their children. When I came to Britain, I thought it was a Christian country with Christian values. When my son was murdered, his throat cut by a racist gang, I thought there may be some feeling for our grief. Nobody from the leadership of any of the main political parties wrote to us or called on us. Nobody from the hierarchy of the church came by. And whilst the police caught the killers, they did nothing to stop the hate calls that came day and night that told us how pleased the callers were that our son was dead. In January of this year, two individuals, Gary Dobson and David Norris, were finally convicted of the murder of Stephen. Dorian said then that it was partial justice. It was the culmination of 18 years of struggle and one which I hope will result in a future in which those words of Richard Asms will never have to be repeated. Um, and finally this, I, I want to take this opportunity because I don't often get the chance to pay tribute to Dorian for the perseverance and determination she has shown to achieve justice, despite the personal cost. I'm just a lawyer. This has been a job for me. It's a career. But Dorian is not shirked from her endeavors or balked at any obstacle despite the many being put in her way. It's been a pleasure and an honor knowing her and what has been a bittersweet journey for me. But one which has given me a greater opportunity of knowing about Stephen and his short life and the telling and the retelling of his stories by Stuart and Georgina. It's clear to me as someone who has lived through the last 19 years, that Stephen's impact, his death, has been huge. He has touched millions of lives and changed many more, including mine. For that alone, I, all of us, and the rest of humankind are deeply indebted to him and Doreen Lawrence. Thank you for listening. <laughs>